Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I am Emma, and we're here to talk about military genealogy. Um, just first off, just save your questions till the end. We'll do a QA. and a um, And then we are recording this webinar, and I will email it out to everybody tomorrow if you missed anything. And then just go ahead and stay muted. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute at the very end. But until then, there's a lot of us in here. Yeah. And then just like, first off, who are we? I'm Emma and Backlog is my company. We're an archival consult consulting firm and we specialize in helping small institutions bridge the digital divide. So meaning bringing collections online um, and helping them you know, connect to their community. We also work on genealogy. Um, we do a, a lot of brick wall research. So if you've got one line that you can't break through, break through a generation, that's kind of where we come in. Um, and again, I'm Emma. I founded Backlog in 2021 after being laid off um, during the pandemic. Um, we do contract archives work, but again, we do a lot of genealogy and that's kind of what we're gonna focus on today. Hi everyone, my name is Ellen and I am a genealogist and librarian and I have an MLIS from, from the University of Missouri, Columbia and a master's in public history with an emphasis in heritage education from Southeast Missouri State University. I'm also currently working on a PhD in history and have worked in genealogy since around 2016. I also have a personal interest in military records due to my family's history and um, being in raised in a military family. I've explored a lot of this history within my own records and research as well. So it's a passion of mine as well as um, being able to help other people with their ancestral research as well. So thanks again for joining us for this webinar on military genealogy records and discovering your ancestor service. Military records are important resources for a lot of different reasons, but we're going to start by looking at some specific details about the different kinds of records and the information they contain. Um, in order to do that, we need to start by looking at information that you'll want to have before you start searching. So before you start searching, you'll want to try and locate the following information, your ancestors' full name, birth and death dates, time and place of service, and their rank at the beginning and end of service. So it can be difficult to find some of this information. So don't be discouraged if you can't find all of it before you start searching, but trying to locate this information will really help your search. And so some places to look for these details about your ancestor include family stories, newspaper clippings and correspondence, scrapbooks, journals, diaries, service medals, memorabilia, photographs in uniform, and grave markers. And many genealogy databases and websites like Ancestry.com and Fold3.com have digital collections that include family stories, newspapers, photographs, and even links to memorial pages that can really help you locate these records and resources. It's also helpful to check with family members and family friends who might have known the ancestor you're researching. Some people may even have personal family collections of photographs, memorabilia, and uniforms. Military records often include a lot of helpful information for genealogists trying to link up family members and expand their family trees. And the ancestral information in military records can include an ancestor's birthplace, occupations, and even their physical characteristics. So why are military records important for genealogy research. Military records are 
important because they also contain information about investors' enlistment dates, rank, unit assignments, battles they may have fought in, and even disciplinary actions at times. Other details could include one's educational history and background, names of family members, and civilian occupations as well. The information found in military records also opens the door for exploring more of the history and events that our ancestor lived, ancestors lived through. Uh, for example, if you find the units an ancestor served with, you can find historical accounts that describe the events, time periods, conflicts, and battles that they participated in. At first glance, all these details might seem minor, but when you put them all together, they provide a much more detailed history of an ancestor's life. So there are many online resources for military records and two major online databases of military records include Ancestry.com and Fold3.com. The National Archives and Records Administration website is another excellent place to gather information and discover the collections available for different time periods and conflicts. However, not all records are available online, so you may have to visit an archive in person or send requests online or even send a form by mail for some of these records. And some records, unfortunately, have also been lost or destroyed due to fires or natural disasters. One well-known example was the 1973 fire at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri. On July 12, 1973, a disastrous National Personnel Records Center fire destroyed approximately 16 to 18 million official military personnel files. And the affected records included 80% of the Army records for discharged personnel between November 1, 1912 to January 1, 1960 and 75% of Air Force records for personnel discharged between September 25th, 1947 to January 1st, 1964. But in the years following the fire, the NPRC or National Personnel Records Center uh, collected numerous records that they referred to as auxiliary records that actually reconstructed some of the basic ser service information that was lost in the fire. So, there still may be some records that they've been able to piece together from that time period. So it's definitely good to check with them to see what additional records may, they may still have for the records and the times that were lost. To access the military records online, you'll want to search for records using different search criteria, such as name, date of birth, military units, and any other pertinent information you might have. And if you're having difficulty locating a specific record, um, it's definitely worthwhile checking in with a genealogy professional, either at Backlog um, or someplace close to you that will help you um, discover some of those missing pieces of information, or they may be able to advise you on other substitute records and things like that if you're having trouble locating um, that information. A few tips for helping you interpret military records include familiarizing yourself with military terminology and abbreviations and paying attention to different clues that you might find within the record. Um, you'll also want to explore the details and information regarding what the record states about your ancestor service. Also remember to note the dates referenced in the records and search for additional clues about your ancestors' marital status, occupation, and their education. And that will really help you when trying to corroborate the information with other types of resources and verify information from other documents that you may have discovered through other resources and records. So the first type of military records we're going to discuss are service records. And service records contain a lot of helpful information about an individual's military service. They could include their enlistment dates, rank, and even their unit assignments. So with this information, 
you could start searching additional records and histories and look up the entire unit history of different uh, places and times in which your ancestors served. So this is an example of an abstract of a service record that you might come across in your search as well. Pension records provide information about an individual's service and any injuries they may have sustained as well as names of family members. So they're a very valuable record for learning about military service, but also if you're looking for other genealogical clues within military records, such as names of spouses or children. So they're definitely worthwhile taking a look at if you haven't done so yet. Um, this is a sample pension record for James Daugherty. And you can see that below there, they have separate listings for um, the widow's application number as well. So take a look at all those different details when you're looking at the records to see what other follow-up records you may be able to locate from a single record. Draft records contain information about individuals who were eligible for military service, but they also may not have actually served. So just because you find a draft record doesn't necessarily mean you'll find additional records such as a service record or pension record. But this is also a situation in which you can find uh, information or genealogical information uh, through military records like draft records, even if someone didn't serve. So this um, is something to consider um, for your non-veteran uh, ancestors as well. Battle reports provide information about specific battles and can help you learn about the military campaigns that your ancestors participated in. And this is a sample report from 1942. And so you can find a lot specifically from World War II era on um, to towards the present time. Um, with the exception of classified documents. So you may run into that a little bit. Um, as far as record limitations go in terms of classification status. But uh, Fold 3, for example, has these World War II battle reports that are really interesting to look at and read through to find out about the daily events that have occurred with a particular unit or battle that they were involved in. Military registers contain information about individuals who served in the mil military uh, around different specific, different time periods, and it includes information about their service and their personal lives, and, and then the extent that uh, you may be able to find locations where they were living and other people that they served with in their unit. So those are interesting details. Um, if you can't directly find information. You may also uh, research some of the other people in their units that they served with to try to find them in other related records. So military registers are another great source of information. So now we're going to go through each of the different wars and conflicts up through the Korean War and look at some specific record sets and collections for each one. The compiled Revolutionary War and military service records from 1775 to 1783 are a great source of information about ancestors who served in the Revolutionary War. This record collection set is on fold3.com. If you go to their website, there's a section where you can select a specific war, such as the Revolutionary War, and that will take you to a general page for that war, which contains an entire publication list. There are also specific record collection sets for the Navy and volunteers between 1784 and 1811. Both of these also have the uh, National Archives and Record as administration's microfilm numbers included in the description on the Fold 3 uh, record collection. And many of these microfilm rolls from NARA have finding aids that go along with them. 
And several of them are also attached or included to their record set on Fold3. So if you go to the website, you can find additional pamphlets with information about several of these record collection sets. So you can find a lot of that information online through Fold3, as you'll see here uh, with other record collection sets that follow. But you can also find Revolutionary War service and imprisonment cards, Revolutionary War pensions, war rolls, manuscript files, and other related service records for the time period in which the Revolutionary War took place, which is 1775 through 1783. Um, however, some of the pension records may extend past that time period. Uh, so do take note of that. You'll notice that with some of the record descriptions as well. For example, the service records of volunteers goes up through 1811. So uh, that's something you'll notice with other record sets and other time periods as well. There are also several War of 1812 record collection sets to know about. For example, there are several naval record collections for the time between 1775 and 1910, as well as army register enlistments from 1798 to 1914. Uh, this specific record collection set of army registers is useful for researching multiple periods and wars because it spans many years. Uh, bounty land warrant applications are also interesting because they're less widely researched than service and pension records, but they contain information about property or land that your ancestor received through their service. So you can discover other avenues for research outside of military records to further your genealogy research, beginning with these bounty land warrant applications. Other record collection sets include the discharge certificates and miscellaneous records of the regular army, 1792 to 1815 as well as the final payment vouchers index for military pensions, 1818 to 1864 and other records. There are a few Mexican War service records on full three for specific states, including Arkansas, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Texas. There's also a specific service records set for a Mormon battalion from the Mexican War. And several of these collections, again, you'll see span a much wider year range um, than the specific conflicts you're looking at immediately, such as the Mexican-American War on this page. Um, but because they span such a wide range of years, they are going to be applicable for more than one time period. So for example, the Army Registers as I mentioned before, it has such a wide year range that it's still useful for researching multiple conflicts. So you'll notice that in other slides as well. There are numerous records for the American Civil War, which took place between 1861 and 1865. One of the most widely used reference collections related to the American Civil War are the Civil War widows' pensions. And they often contain information about the spouse of the veteran, so it's definitely helpful to try and look for these records. However, you may need to search by different names as well as the service member's name in order to find some of these records. And the records contain a lot of helpful and crucial genealogical information, which is why a lot of genealogists specifically try to find these pensions. There are also official records of the Union and Confederate navies on Fold 3, as well as a Civil War Pensions Index and a Civil War Service Index. I've also highlighted a few specific service record listings here that may be helpful for the surrounding St. Louis area, including Union records for the state of Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Ohio, as well as Confederate records for Missouri. There are also several unit histories on Fold 3 related to the Civil War. And another resource is the National Park Service's Soldiers and Sailors Database. It's a great place to start if you need to know what unit your ancestor served with. And with that index's information, you can locate the actual service record or pension record. So it's a wonderful resource 
for civil war research. The Spanish American War records on Fold 3 include the Spanish American War Service Record Index and the complete Spanish American War Service Records for the state of Florida. And when you look at those record collection sets, there'll be a percentage marked on each one. And if it's complete, like the record set for Florida, it'll say 100%. And so you'll be able to tell how far along Fold 3 is in digitizing the collection and how many may still be uh, at NARA or one of the archive centers and just hasn't been digitized. So that's something to take note of if you haven't um, looked for those percentages before. Records for the US involvement in World War I typically center around the years 1917 to 1918. And one of the most helpful collections for genealogists is the naturalization index of World War I soldiers. The Navy cruise books are another interesting collection that is helpful for researching both World War I and World War II because they span the years 1918 to 2009. And the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I is a well-known group from World War I that you may have read about in various history books about the First World War. So you may find this information interesting if you are a history buff, um, but you also happen to have an ancestor who served in the American Expeditionary Forces. Uh, it may also help you find specific genealogical information for them as well. So, in addition to the naturalization indexes and the unit histories and the pension payment cards, there are also specific uh, draft registration cards for this time period. Um, we'll also talk about some of the World War II draft registers as well, but there is some overlap um, within World War I and World War II. So you may have people listed in both drafts. Um, that does happen occasionally. And then there are also World War I burial cards. And then there's all sorts of unit histories um, that are, some are digitized through Fold 3. So you can have access to some of those resources that were not as easily accessible in the past, which is a wonderful new development for the National Archives. Sources of information for World War II records include histories and rosters of squadrons, units, and air groups. A few examples that are available online through fold3.com include combat squadrons of the Air Force in World War II, uh, missing air crew reports, Medal of Honor recipients, 1863 to 2013, uh, Pearl Harbor muster rolls, 1939 to 1947, Navy muster rolls, 1938 to 1949, and World War II Army enlistment records. Uh, you can also find World War II hospital admission card files between 1942 and 1953, uh, U.S. Navy and Marine Corps awards and decorations between 1942 and 1994, as well as World War II missing in action and lost in sea, reports, as well as the Stars and Stripes newspaper online through fold3.com. And so there are multiple sets of World War II draft cards, um, including the US World War II draft, draft cards of young men 1940 through 1947. And the first draft registration under the 1940 Selective Training and Service Act required all males ages 21 through 36 to register on October 16, 1940. Between 1941 and 1943, there were five more registrations and the ages changed to 18 through 44. One exception is the fourth registration or old man's draft. Because the registration years overlap again, men born between uh, 1877 through 1900 may have registered twice and have both World War II and World War I draft records. So that's also something to take note of.
The National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis uh, maintains Korean War official military personnel files or the OMPFs, but there are some digital collections of records that could include records for an ancestor who served in the Korean War as well. And these collections include the army registers, which you've seen previously on other slides, the defense POW um, and MIA accounting agency records, uh, the Hill Air Force Base archive of unit histories, photos, and records is a really interesting resource um, if you're just interested in Korean War history as well. And then there are also lists of Korean War casualties, as well as the Navy muster rolls, which again span multiple conflicts, and then the U.S. veterans grave sites, 1775 through 2019, which again would span all of these conflicts. So for the Korean War, there are also many unit and squadron histories that were written by the people who experienced the war firsthand. And while these aren't military records, per se, in the sense of draft records or official service record files, they do incorporate a lot more detail and explore the actual events from the perspective of someone who lived through them. So one method to continue building on the information from these books is to search the bibliography at the back and take note of the resources, archives, and repositories that the author cites in those books as well. So some common challenges that researchers face when researching military records are incomplete records, conflicting information, language barriers, and lack of context. And when compiling data from multiple sources, you'll notice some inconsistencies or discrepancies in the information provided a lot of the time. For instance, a service record might conflict with a unit's combat report and this could be due to various reasons, such as errors during data entry, different perspectives, or misinterpretations. And mistakes can also be made by those who created the records at the time of creation and those who are interpreting them today. And these mistakes can result from things like misread handwriting, transposed numbers, and even misspelled names. And unfortunately, Fortunately, this can also create conflicting and inconsistent information. If you encounter some of these challenges, a genealogy professional can help you locate hard to find records, interpret military terminology and abbreviations and provide context for the inf information contained in military records. They can also help you corroborate and analyze the discrepancies in the records and help you piece together an ancestor's military service. So accessing and interpreting military records can be both challenging and rewarding, but you can uncover really valuable information about your ancestor's life and military service by researching and locating military records. Uh, military records can also help you find new paths for further research and discovery. Okay, um, so that's it for this webinar. Our next webinar is on Monday, June 5th, and it's, it's about how to decipher handwriting and print. So we'll go over different handwriting techniques that were taught over time and different kinds of prints, and then kind of give you some strategies um, for deciphering those. Um, and then in, in July, we're going to go over digital inheritance, which basically just means what happens to your accounts after you die. Um, for certain platforms, there's ways to have it, um, your information be left to a family member or sometimes accounts are deleted. Um, so we'll go over that in July. Um, and I'm going to send out an email tomorrow to everybody who registered with a link to this recording, but also to a link to register for those webinars. Okay, and there's a lot going on in my background, so I'm going to mute and leave the, um, one of my neighbors is having some kind of DJ practice, um, and I'm <laughs> going to turn this over to Ellen.
Okay, so I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you have. Um, some of them may be specific to your particular ancestor or situation. So if need be, um, we'll definitely take your emails and get back to you as well with that. Emma, this is Debbie Griffith. I have a question, and this may not be what you're covering, but I heard you at the very beginning mention tribal. And there is a genealogy source, I think it's called Tribal Nations. And my brother and his wife put a lot of our family ancestry out there, but both of them passed away. And I don't know how I've tried to get access to them, but I can't get any kind of response from them. And I'm just wondering if you know when you have these large genealogy resources, how, how one can track getting hold of them to say, you know, I'd like to take it over, the information that's out there for our family. Um, I'm not familiar with that specific platform. Um, and then the problem really is, is that unless you have like a contingency plan, um, you can't get back into it. Um, so that that is a major problem. All right. Well, that's uh, so I don't have a good answer for you. Okay. Well, I have tried for a couple of years and I get no response, no matter how I, I try to contact them. Um, so I guess that will just assume that anything out there is gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. And a lot of what we're going to cover in that webinar is, is how to like set up plans and make sure that our things don't disappear, especially things like digital photographs and how can we pass them on to our families. So, so unfortunately, you know, when you put things in platforms and that platform gets bought out or you forget your password, that is the problem. And then it's really bad with like, like ancestry, like you don't, you don't own that, like those records. And so there's a lot of, you know, like, should you download your things? Um, and it's just kind of like a, a caveat of using these websites. All right. Bye. Thank you for your answer. So if nobody has any more questions, um, I'll just send out an email tomorrow with a link to this recording. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope you found this helpful. It, it, thank you a lot, guys, ladies. Uh, it was very informative, just lots of lots of information. It was uh, it's also a good review of, of um, Western history. Thank that, you. That we took in freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take good care. You as well. Thank you.